There we go. All right. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Jillian. I'm so glad to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for being willing and open to share about your experience with biofield tuning and some other things we're going to hear about. Uh, Oh, of course. It is like so exciting and fun for me to get to do this. Yes. And you just got back from a long trip to uh, Washington um, and you're ready to go today. Let's go. Awesome. (laughs) And just so you know, like it's super exciting for me being on the podcast with you because I have been like loyally listening to you all the way along and I love the show. So it's so, it's like, (laughs) Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. That's so nice to hear. Thank you for being a loyal listener. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, we want to hear about your background and how you found biofield tuning. And then what the reason why I decided to have you on the podcast and decided to ask you to be on the podcast is because I saw you on um, Facebook doing your Facebook lives. And I was like, oh, she's got it going on. The Sandra Lee, I got to talk to her. <laughs> I really so appreciate you, you reaching out about, you know, marketing and all that. Yeah. Okay. So the history, yeah. I have a bachelor's in chemistry from the California Institute of Technology. So science background, Mm -hmm. which, and then I proceeded after graduating to, you know, have a clerical job. And then I started studying acupressure and doing healing work. And at that point, I had to come to terms with something because my background was both logical and scientific. And then I was starting to do energy work. And I was like, okay, so like, how do I justify these things? Because I still do logic and I do the intuitive And I had to be able to just bring them together and be okay with not everything being explainable and logical and provable because energy stuff like has an impact. Yeah. And so I, I, I brought those two together, like when I was in my twenties, which was really fortunate, I think, because Uh, a lot of people have to get to that place a lot later. Yes. In their process. Yes. It can take a long time. It's a, it's a big jump. Yeah. So I learned acupressure and shiatsu and I did Reiki and then I moved to Washington state to Olympia, Washington. And I um, like got clerical jobs and doing other things. And then I started, I did massage school. And I started being a massage therapist in 92. And then between 92 and basically now is like 30 years in there. And I had learned a lot of different energy healing modalities, lots. I don't even know what they all are anymore, but I wasn't actively using them. Mm-hmm. Aside from the Reiki that just goes with, with contact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wasn't actually doing any of those techniques because I didn't feel like I was doing anything. I didn't feel like it was changing things. So it's like when I do massage and I have, I work on one side of the body and then I have the person stand up and they can feel like they're lopsided. Their body is really different. And then we put them on the other side and we do the other side. So I'm accustomed to doing work and having there be an obvious change. We can't miss the fact that something has changed. And I didn't feel like I was getting that kind of result with energy work. So I wasn't doing it, but I was still learning these different things. And probably about eight years ago, I went to a conference and took a one day workshop with a different type of tuning fork modality. Because back when I was in the acupressure days, I took a class in sonopuncture. So using tuning forks on points. And this was like a long, this was like 87. Okay. Like way early time. Yeah. It was like 30 yeah. some years ago. Yeah. Long, long, long time ago. So when I saw that they were having this class at the ASAP conference, I was like, oh, tuning forks. I should take that because I hadn't been doing anything with the tuning forks that I had. The ones that I have are, are like um, a music scale. So CD, right? Uh-huh. I, I still have them. I don't ever use them. But so um, I, I learned that modality, this and I was doing the modality, but I wasn't doing the modality. 
I wasn't working with meridians and, you know, all those things that they teach because I was just using the tuning forks to do what I do when I'm doing and when I'm doing body work, yeah. taking blocked energy and helping it to move. Uh-huh. Uh, and were you doing this mostly on the body? On the body. Uh-huh. Yes. This was, this was all, all hard fans on. Yeah. I, I had never considered doing this just like Eileen talks about how, you know, somebody suggested she do distant healing. And so I was like, you know, I can't do that. That's not going to do anything. Right. So I wasn't even thinking about doing any distance work with the tuning forks, but it was really effective at taking blocked energy and helping it to move from one place to another place. That's how I was doing tuning forks. And then um, along came by the tuning kind of by accident. <laughs> Maybe that's true for a lot of people. They get to it by accident. Right. And I was one of the people who was exposed first through the shift network. And so through the first class, I signed up for foundations and here we are. What year is that? That was, I, I, my certification was complete at the beginning of the pandemic shutdown in March, 2020. Okay. So it was 2019 when I did training foundations. Yeah. Yeah. That shift network course opened up a a huge market for <laughs> bringing lots of people. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I'm so glad. So, but biofield tuning is much um, more my style. Mm -hmm. You know, the other program, the other training is much more um, protocol based and like the meridians and, you know, so all that stuff is just too much too much information for me, too much structure for me. Uh -huh. I like biofood tuning. I mean, yes, there's science behind it, but it's like, it's much more loose. And how, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's more room, I think, in biofield tuning. I, I haven't taken any of those other kinds of courses, but what it sounds like is there's more room and opportunity to trust yourself and trust your own senses with this work. Yes. And since that's like a really strong part of how I work anyway, mm -hmm. biofo tuning is perfect because when I was doing body work, right, yeah. I'm doing the same thing. I'm just like, okay, there's energy blocked here. So get it to move. Yeah. Right. And working with the, the trauma and the emotional comment co content and the stresses in somebody's life. Right. I really actively work with that in doing body work. Yeah. And I get a lot of intuitive information. So all of that just kind of transferred over to biofield tuning. And then, so um, my certification got complete, right? Like my training went pretty quickly. Um, it's like I'm, I'm supposed to be here. Things just kind of fell into place. I got, I got into both foundations and practitioner training ahead of the waiting list just because of the way things happened. Yeah. <laughs> Matt was part of that. <laughs> yeah. Right. I remember you telling me that, that is so yeah. awesome. So it's like, and certification was complete the day I came home when pandemic shutdown started. So it was like every step of the way, this is exactly the right place yeah. for me to be. Yeah. So my massage practice like evaporated because I can't work on people in person. So I was like, okay, let's just start doing bifid tuning. Yeah. So it just happened. Okay. Yeah. So, so you got certified and then the pandemic happened. You couldn't see people in person anymore. So you just made that natural transition from massage to remote biofield tuning all, all at one time. Wow. And not a, yeah, in not a very big span of time, very short. And now we're at 2020, the end of 2021. And where's your practice at now? Well, so it, because I was going from British Columbia, where I live, to almost all of my work being in Olympia, Washington, doing massage, mm -hmm. I would have, so it's like I had my first quarter of income, like basically through March, 2020. And so I started doing biofield tuning and in four months I had exceeded my first quarter income. Mm -hmm. I had replaced wow. my massage income in four months. Oh, wow. With For the, wow. For the year, like what you would have made in a year well, you made in four months? No. I mean, basically I had the first quarter of 2020. Okay. So I had yeah. that to measure, right? Okay. So from, from March to March, April, May, to July, 
Yeah. Right. I had exceeded that first quarter income. Okay. Okay. Got it. How? And cool. then, and then by the end of the year, I had like six times my first quarter income. Oh, wow. So I had exceeded what I would have made for the year with something that I started from zero. How do you think that happened? Um, part of it was that it was just a natural, it, it was like a lateral move, right? All the skills that I have in massage, all the intuitive work that I already do, the way that I work with people energetically is like, it just kind of like slid over to my own tuning. And yeah. it, you know, I, it works really naturally for me to do distance work mm. because, you know, people couldn't come here. So I just kind of started. Now, I also do human design, which we're going to talk about. And a significant part of how I got started was um, that my teacher, Karen Curry Parker, she has something called the quantum alignment show, where every week there's just like this free session available for anyone to attend about some aspect of human design. Uh -huh. And a friend and I, we would do the quantum alignment show. So we did the quantum alignment show. This was in May. So it's like started in March, right? In May, I did the quantum alignment show with my friend where we were talking about biofood tuning and human design. And from that, I just got this whole little set of people who wanted to work with me. And so that was kind of the start. And then it just kind of spread from there. So these people were in the human design community. And they started working with you doing biofield tuning. Yeah. Yeah. And some of them were people I knew anyway. Right. So it's like, it just kind of, it just kind of happened. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say you were, you were in alignment and that's, that's what worked. Plus I'm sure that you believed it was possible to exceed that income. I mean, what were you, what were you thinking when the pandemic like struck, I should say, it's like, <laughs> it's a strong word, but well, I, you know, I took the government's money in the beginning, mm -hmm. which helped me pay, you know, that first month's credit card bills and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, then after that first round of it stopped, I got it for like six months or something like that. And then I didn't need it anymore. Mm. I didn't need it anymore. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It was really nice. Yeah. Wow. What timing. It, it was. It just happened. Like you think this was one of those pandemic things. didn't happen. Like what, what are your thoughts? Like if there was no sort of circumstance sort of forcing you into something different, what do you think would have happened? Well, so I have been doing human design for like eight years mm -hmm. and I never really put the effort in to just like, okay, we got to build this. Right. I just kind of like did it at the same time. And I wasn't doing very much human design because a lot of my life was centered around, you know, basically I would be home in British Columbia for a month and then I'd be down in Washington for two weeks to a month. And then I'd come home for a month. So I was like, I was back and forth as migratory. Mm -hmm. And so just a lot of my life was focused around this, you know, it's like, oop, do my work and then come home. Right. And I don't know if I would have done it the same way. If not for like, okay, my work is gone. Right. Yeah. You had to completely shift. Yeah. Can and you, that wound up being just right for me. Right. Right. Yeah. Would have, it probably would have been a lot longer of a process, huh? Of getting to where you're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain to people who may not know what human design is, what it is? Human design give me a chart based on where the planets were. Only, sorry, they'll only be able to hear us. So they won't be able to see the chart. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me a chart based on my birth date that tells me a lot about who I am. It's the same information that you would have on an astrology chart, except there's two sets of planetary information. And it colors in this colorful chart that's got shapes and lines and stuff on it. And, um, it tells crazy amounts of accurate information about what my experience of life is. The themes I'm going to have in my life, the things I'm good at, the things that I struggle with and have problems with, the sorts of things of like, why does this happen 
It's, it's all in the human design chart. Yeah. I had a human design reading with you for my business and it was very affirmative. You know, some, of, some of the things were enlightening, um, but a lot of the things were very affirmative. Like, um, one of the ways my business would be most successful is by resting and taking breaks. And I was like, yeah, my business already, I know that my business told me that. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, how do you integrate? Oh, go ahead. These are the kinds of things that are in the chart and people don't recognize as being things. I think of it that it's like a fish in a fish bowl. The fish doesn't know that the water is there. That's what the human design chart the themes in the human design chart are like there's so much of course isn't everybody like that that you don't recognize yeah. that it's even there and by having it be distinguished by having me say hey jillian right this is something that would help you and you say oh yeah i do that and so it's like you realize instead of just like stumbling into this thing that works that it's actually part of your plan. It's part of your design. Yes. And enables you to take like ownership of it and be conscious of living those things instead of um, just kind of like going along and doing it, right? So it's like now that you're aware of that, that's totally been much more conscious for you now. Yep, absolutely. It's kind of like, you know, thinking of video games, you know, you you have certain... Uh, skills or, you know, whatever, and you learn how to use them, like how to put them to use. So it's just like that. When you become aware of something that's sort of inherent in you, you're like, okay, how can I use this to my advantage? Well, and one of the things that I talked with you about during your human design reading, I don't know if we talked about this specific aspect of it, but to understand that this can also be part of your languaging part of your marketing. Mm. So it's like something yeah. that you might help other people with is for entrepreneurs to understand, right? By the tuning practitioners starting their businesses, right? That rest is also important to them. Yes. If, if uh, listeners haven't heard me say that enough, <laughs> here it is again. <laughs> rest is important. Play is important with your business. Yeah. Hustling does not work. Mm -hmm. So when you understand that these are central aspects of your design to actually incorporate it into your awareness and your speaking, your written material, your website, all those kinds of things. Yeah. So how do you integrate, how do you use both human design and biofield tuning in your practice? I was doing a distant session, biofield tuning session one day. And I started seeing the human design chart overlaid over the biofield. So cool. The human design chart's like a triangle. And I was like, oh, I can do these together. Because of course, they're both based around this kind of central structure of the chakras. So these are overlaid in our lives. They're just slightly different ways of looking at it and working with it. So doing them together, I purposely and consciously do them together. So once I've done somebody's human design chart and I'm doing biofield tuning for them, something will come up just like it does in biofield tuning sessions. Whether they're aware of it or not, it comes up in the field. I was like, oh, I wonder how that shows up in the human design chart. So I go over and I look at their human design chart. And I was like, oh, this thing you're struggling with or dealing with, here's how it's showing up in your human design. And let's work with it in the field. Oh my gosh. I love that because you can work on it from a subconscious level, but then also having their chart right there gives them practical ways to manage it outside of the session as well. Is that aware? Absolutely. A big part of how I do human design is, okay, so this is something you're struggling with. This is something you're dealing with. Okay. Here's practical strategies for managing it. Yeah. Can you give us an example of someone you can think of maybe recently that um, had a session and something in their human design came up? Uh, let me start. This is somebody 
who came to me for both human design and biofield tuning, but her focus first was human design mm -hmm. because this was, this was her big complaint really for her whole life. She said, for my whole life, everyone always comes to me when they want something. They want help. They have a question. They need something from me. Why doesn't anybody ever ask me how I'm doing? Mm. She wanted them to pay attention to her and they came to her just wanting help. And it bothered her her whole life. It had bothered her. And yeah. when we looked at her human design chart, you know, you and I talked about the conscious sun, this central aspect of your human design chart. That's about what you do in all areas of life. And so I told her, you know, let's look at your conscious son in all areas of life in some way or other, you are always helping people. You are always helping people. That was in her chart is well, it's the strongest energy in her chart. Uh huh. The, the sun is what you do all of the time, 24 uh -huh. seven in some way or other you're doing the sun. And so I helped her realize that that is the strongest energy that her chart is beaming out into the world. Yeah. And by people coming to her, asking her for help, it was actually an acknowledgement that they did see her, that they did see what she was good at and what she was contributing. And they came to her wanting what she offers. Mm -hmm. Seeing that changed her whole world. Wow. Yeah, it it moved her from that sort of victim posturehood to like something of more empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. So when I saw her for biofield tuning the next week, she was a totally different person. Hmm. All of the resistance was gone, right? Like people had come to her asking for help, but she saw it completely different. The lens was different. Yeah. That she was looking at it through. So we took her biggest problem and turned it into a gift. Wow. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Really cool. And then what showed up in biofield tuning for her? Just different um, patterns related to To tell you the to truth, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember her. Okay. But, you know, I look at biofield tuning and what comes up in biofield tuning as being context dependent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, if a person is in one place in their thoughts, there can be flow and then they shift their thought pattern and there's a block mm -hmm. and then they shift their thought pattern again. And so it clears. Right. So it's like part of the power of biofilm tuning is it energetically takes those block stuck places and allows the thought pattern or the belief pattern or the physical pattern to shift. Yeah. Very cool. What a cool way to, um, integrate both modalities, uh, you know, one working with the subconscious biofield tuning, and then the other working with consciousness. I mean, they're both, both, but it feels like one's more of, you know, the other. Yeah. <laughs> <That> makes sense. <laughs> well, the, like I saw when I saw the human design chart overlaid on the biofield, they're always together. Yeah. We're always working with all of the layers. Mm -hmm. We're not necessarily conscious of working with all the layers, but we are always working with all the layers. Yeah. That's part of why biofield tuning has such a dramatic impact sometimes. Yes. And sometimes it's making things conscious first, which um, affects the subconscious. And then other times it's working with the subconscious first that brings things more to the conscious mind. It's really interesting. I love it so much. Just why whenever anybody's on my table and they're like, I'm not feeling anything. I don't know. I don't notice any difference. I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> yeah. Trust it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about... Um, who you work with in your marketing and, you know, why did you catch my eye on Facebook lives? But, Cause you, you start, I noticed that we were, we have been Facebook friends for a while, at least, at least a year, if not longer than that. Um, and I, I started seeing your Facebook lives on there. I think you had just started doing them. Am I right? Or have you, been mm, them? you I, I started doing them really actively at the beginning of the year. Okay. 
Okay. So tell us about that process because I think Facebook lives scare people. I totally get it. (laughs) So I have gotten, I have been comfortable um, speaking with people in person, like giving lectures and things like that. I've been doing that for years. So doing the public speaking part really wasn't um, an issue. I decided to hire someone to help me to do Facebook. Uh And I'm doing all the content, but he's just teaching me how to do it. And he got me started um, making posts, multiple posts every day, and um, including having one video post every day. And in the beginning, I scripted them, (laughs) which is really really awkward and awful. (laughs) And uh, and, and I stopped doing that pretty quickly (laughs) because it was just it, it feels stilted and stuff like that. But just uh-huh. so you know, if anybody is thinking about going out there and just starting to do it, just start, just do it. Just talk. Right? Nobody is going to care if you make mistakes or whatever. Yeah. And, and people easier. want to see the real you. Like that's what, if, if I see someone reading from a script, I'm like, okay, bye. But if I see someone like talking to me and they don't have a script, I'm way more interested in yeah. watching So for those of you out there who aren't doing this yet, just do it, right? It'll be really uncomfortable in the beginning and then it'll get easier, I guarantee. Now um, I just talk and occasionally I mess up so much right in the beginning that I delete it and I start over again, but that doesn't happen very often. Mostly I just like do it and I don't care if I make a mistake. For people to know that there's that option, you can just delete it. It doesn't have to be recorded on Facebook forever. Yep. Yeah. And so now I just, I just do it. You pick a a topic to talk about how, what's your process? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it's about human design. Sometimes it's about biofit tuning. Um, Sometimes, well, a lot of times it's about both together because I really am specializing in working with both together. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you post great food photos. Almost every day. <laughs> yeah. Food pictures. Yeah. I love them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. So multiple posts a day, at least one video a day. And- yeah. No, I ha- some days I don't do a video. I started okay. out in the beginning, but um, now um, most days, it really depends on how crazy, how busy things are. So, yeah, because it takes some thought and focus. Yeah, do a video. Although yeah. you know, not too much now that I just do them all the time. It's, yeah, and, and I'm not attached to them being perfect either, right? Like it's like okay, well that was kind of goofy. Oh well, and it's like it's, it's just out there on Facebook. Now I do use Streamyard, which enables me to automatically post to three places. So it always goes to YouTube and I have um, my Facebook profile and a Facebook group and, um, you know, a public figure page. Oh, cool. So for the lowest level of, I mean, there's free StreamYard, um, but I don't recommend that anybody do free StreamYard. Basically get the lowest level of paid StreamYard and it enables you to download your files. You can download video, you can download audio. And it'll automatically post for me to YouTube and two places on Facebook. It'll post to Instagram. It'll post, you know, like multiple places. It's like so worth it getting StreamYard. Cool. That's the first time I've heard of it. I know, uh, I know a Facebook business suite, but that's just limited to Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. So that's what um, you hear about. Zoom will broadcast simultaneously to YouTube and to Facebook. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't enable you to start things, you know, first and then rec- it's like, it's clunky in, in Zoom. StreamYard is so much easier. I just like set it all up. And then the person, co- if I'm interviewing somebody, right, the person comes into the, you know, editing, you know, the video suite or whatever. And then we can talk for as long as we want to and then go live. Nice. And then when we're done with live, we can turn the live off and I can talk. Oh, with that's them. really cool because on Instagram live, you have to, it, you go live and then you bring the person on. So there's kind of, it can be clunky in the beginning when you're, when you have two or more people on there with you. Yeah. In StreamYard, I have 
they say you can have up to 10 people. I've oh, never wow. done anywhere near to that, uh-huh. but um, yeah. And it just, it just automatically goes to these places. It's effortless coordinating all that. Yeah. Nice. What have you, what have you noticed since doing, you know, the social media marketing and videos? Um, that people like them. Um, sometimes I am not sure what people are going to interact with. Um, I get actually a lot more interaction with the things that are not business related. So it's important to have some business and some, you know, whatever. Um, I don't have Facebook marketing down yet. Yeah, me neither. And I hear it's quite a science. Yeah. And I, it's a little, ah, I don't know how to do that yeah. thing. Fortunately, when I'm ready to do the actual um, ads and stuff like that, the, yeah. the guy who got me into this, <laughs> right, he can take care of that part. So yeah, good. Good. I recommend to people, don't try to do it all yourself. Get help. Yes. Uh-huh. Get help. I would totally agree with that. Yeah. If you're feeling eh about something, that's a good indicator that you might want to reach out to some external resources and get the help. Yeah. So um, I decided in August to ta- stop trying to market to everyone and to niche yeah. down and focus on entrepreneurs and their businesses. Yeah. And in coordination with doing that, um, th- this was all timed around, I had a, 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 ch- a book, a, a human design book that I wrote a chapter in. And so that was coming out in October. So to get all of this ready for an October launch of the book, I hired people. So I hired a copywriter for the website. I hired somebody to develop the website. I hired somebody to make a video. So I was like, I have people that I hired to do this. I have a marketing director. That's amazing. Yeah. Like I would never have thought that I would be in this place of having hired people, but it, it has enabled me to do things I wasn't able to do by myself. Yeah. Tell us the name of your book. It is stop overworking and start overflowing 25 ways to transform your life with human design. Oh, nobody's going to see it, but you. (laughs) I was just going to say that again. (laughs) Yeah. And um, my chapter is um, turning dreams into successes. What chapter? Human human design and biofield tuning for your business. I love it. I love it. Uh, How do people buy it? Um, I just send people to Amazon. Amazon. Okay. If you want a signed copy, I have a very limited number of copies available for people to buy. And how would they get that? Um, contact me at this how point. Do they, how do they do that? <laughs> and, um, miracleinspirations.com is my website. Yeah. So it's mir- the word miracle followed by the word inspiration with an S on the end.com. And through there, you can contact me. Awesome. And you said you, you're working with entrepreneurs to grow their business, use human design and biofield tuning. So everybody that's listening, Sandra is another amazing resource for you. If you want to grow your practice, right? Yes. 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 So, reach so out let me tell you a little bit more about that. Okay. Uh-huh. One of the big things about human design is it tells you the themes that are going to be in your life, the things you're good at and the areas where you're going to struggle. When you put all that together, it put goes together into what your purpose is, how you serve. So we do human design and help you understand how you serve. And then we do biofield tuning and help you see in terms of the biofield tuning, how you serve and how you're expressing that purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the results that you've seen or some of the, the ways in which it's helped entrepreneurs? My Facebook guy, when we did a biofield tuning session for his business, Within that next week, he had just like, bam, five new clients. Amazing. Yes. Like they just showed up. I have um, several people who I have helped where they're in a want to have a business place, but not yet doing it. And like overwhelmed, 
too many options, too many irons in the fire, not sure where to go, and they get paralyzed. Yeah. Now, people who are doing biofilm tuning might not be so much in that place because presumably we know that they're already going to be doing biofilm tuning. But if you are in this place of overwhelm, don't know which way to go, too many things, too many directions, right? Then this can help focus it, right? So it's like looking at what does your design say? How are you designed to contribute? Um, How are you designed to talk to people, right? To just take these things that are kind of all over the place and help you clarify them. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people can probably relate to that, especially, especially our newer practitioners who are like, well, I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to do this. Never had my own business. Right. So yep. yeah, that would be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's talk about an, another aspect of it. Yeah. So there's something in human design called your strategy. And your strategy is how you were designed to enter into things, how you're designed to enter into relationships, enter into projects, enter into jobs and things like that. And when you understand how you were designed to enter into things, it can help you not enter into things incorrectly. So it's like, there are some people, manifestors, that are really designed to initiate, to, to start things. That's something that in our culture, we are told that everyone should do that. Just decide what you want and go do it. The truth is, most people aren't designed to do that. Most people are designed in some way or other to respond to signs from the world around you that call you to do things. And when you understand how you were designed to enter into things and how you were designed to make decisions that are going to have a long-term impact. Yeah. Understanding that helps you not like step in piles of mess. Uh-huh. And actually be more successful out of the gate rather than having to do things by trial and error, which is what most people do. Yeah. So it sounds like by knowing what your design is, you can be more effective at launching and kind of skip the whole trial and error piece. I mean, there will probably still be a little bit of that, but. but not yeah. so much. Not, here, not here, here's an example. So human design is really designed for children most. Because if a parent understands the human design of the child when they're young, then as that child grows up, right? The parent is able to provide guidance, knowing what the design is to help them go in the right directions. Mm. And if a child is has the tendency to have negative behavior patterns, for example, because sometimes we do, right? The parent can say, oh, there that is, okay. And then head it off before it gets into a real habit. Yeah. So that um, they are able to adjust how they are doing these things to not have the not so good behavior and channel it in positive directions before it becomes a problem. Things that, um, well, one example. So it's like one person I did human design reading for, for her son. Um, I said, he doesn't know when enough is enough and he doesn't know when to stop. And she said, oh, we deal with that all the time. 14 year old boy tickling girls at school. Oh, not a good thing, but it was a way of getting attention. Uh Uh-huh. But had that parent known about this potential when he was young, she could have headed up, you know, modified that behavior in the boy before it got to be the point of being like socially unacceptable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You really got my wheels turning with that one. I'll have to get the human design chart for our girls, but it also makes me think about business, you know, kind of thinking of your, your business. That's what you did with my business human design anyway, is like, we looked at the birth date of the business and how the business came to be and the qualities. And it's really interesting. Yeah. So it's fun too. It's really fun. Yeah. It was fun to do it. 
um, with entrepreneurs. So you would look at their, their personal human design and their business human design. And then, and then with biofield tuning, also the, the same thing, work with their personal field and also the, the business field. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. So cool. What, one of my clients, um, I, every week I work on one of his businesses. He has so many businesses. It's like all these different things that he's got his toes in. And um, so every week I just work on one of his businesses. Plus I work on him. And so, yeah, but it, it's been actually really interesting. So it's like some of his businesses are um, construction and business and, uh, you know, um, like big business and, you know, they'll be tied up in a, um, you know, building, um, you know, building per permit, you know, that kind of thing, permitting with dealing with the government. So mm -hmm. it's like, there'll be places where it's kind of stuck. And so I just do biofood tuning and things just kind of start moving. <laughs> Isn't cool. I love it. Yeah. I think, I think oftentimes we forget about projects like project tunings and, um, things that are not people, <laughs> businesses, uh, our bank accounts, you know, things like that, that can be tuned. Absolutely. Worked through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you share anything that's maybe been a challenge for you in your practice that you overcame to, um, give other practitioners some insight, some encouragement? What comes up to say, I'm not sure if this is what you were looking for, but, um, there was a point where I was doing a lot of tuning, tunings at this point, and I had a brachial plexus, like I had pain in my upper back, which I now know is the brachial plexus, and I had tension in my arm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I could not hold a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was that from tuning? Um, it was from, you know, years of having tension in my neck and in this, this shoulder, um, I had taken um, a class, um, a massage class working with the sacrum and with some of the things that she walked us through doing had activated this brachial plexus. But this is an area where I always thought a rib was out. Ah. And it just kind of happened a couple of times a year. And I now know it's a brachial plexus. It wasn't a rib out ever. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay. But it was really debilitating. And um, this was like February of this year. And um, I couldn't hold a puck. And at this point, I was doing a lot of biofilm tuning. And okay, so how am I going to do this? So I learned to tune with my left hand. And to sit down and rest my arm on a ball, right? So that I could hold the puck. <laughs> there you go. Crazy. But now I am just as good tuning with my left as with the right. Yeah, that's awesome. I think there are many of us seasoned practitioners who have dealt with some sort of right, if we're right-handed, um, some sort of right-sided stress-related injury or just overuse and there is a, there comes a time where you need to learn how to practice with your left hand. And I've always resisted it. <laughs> there was a time where I also had a shoulder injury, but I had to tune with my left hand. It was the only way I could do it. I hated doing it. Um, but what I would say for people now is let, start practicing now with your other hand. And that way that might even prevent, you know, overuse and, yeah. um, well, and now depending on what I'm doing, sometimes it's more convenient tuning with the right, tuning with the left. I can do both. Mm -hmm. And I, I do it all sitting at, at a table now. I don't walk around the table anymore. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I've had my, my sitting tunes too, especially uh, the days when my lower back was bothering me, mm -hmm. but it just kind of shrink the hologram down. Right. And work yep. there, work that way. Yeah. Nice. Just make it easier for your body. You want another tip? Yes. A super common thing that I see in the practitioners and students group 
is people not sure about what to do because they feel attached to the recipe, to the protocol. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're going to agree with me. It's like, you know what? You don't have to have a protocol. The protocol is there to guide you, to give you a general structure to work with, and then make it up. Mm -hmm. Eileen makes it up all the time. Yes. Yes. You can make it up too. Yes. That actually today I had a client um, come to me who she's had COVID for two weeks and she wants tuning to help her rebound and bounce back. And she goes, so what do you think you'll do? And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) I have no idea. Like I'm going to get in there and I'm going to listen and uh, we'll see. (laughs) And um, I ended up doing something today that was different than anything I've ever done, but I just took the two Solfeggio, I'm sorry, not Solfeggio, the two Fibonacci forks. And I just kind of, I combed through her field, but not in the way that we normally comb. I went from head to toe and I just followed kind of the layers of her field, like the layer layers of an onion. It just felt really soothing and calming and energizing at the same time. So yeah, it's no sessions ever the same. We never know what you're going to do. I, I don't even like to think about sessions before I do them. Just, you know, I, the only thing I think about is what time am I meeting this person <laughs> in the ether <laughs> and the session starts then at that time. But I know that there are some practitioners out there who like to, uh, who like to start the session before the session begins. That's just not my style. Everybody has their own way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and go with it. It works. Mm -hmm. Right. But when it, when it comes to overthinking and over, um, worrying about, you know, what's going to happen that that's where, you know, want to let that part go. In my opinion, we can't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the same time, we have the potential to really help. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really good thing to bring up. Thank you for that. Don't attach to any recipe. <laughs> and I love that you use the word recipe because I see your food pictures on Facebook all the time. Tell us about, <laughs> tell us about your food before we wrap up. What do you love? Well, about- so I have been making whole food, you know, starting with basic ingredients, meals for years, 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 years. And, um, basically two years ago now I was in, um, in a coaching group And, um, I decided during the summertime to start posting pictures of my food every day. And I did it for two weeks and then I stopped because this wasn't something I was planning to continue to do. And then people like asked me to post them again. And one person told me that she had lost weight because of my pictures. Oh, wow. Because it inspired her to eat better. Uh-huh. My pictures have inspired lots of people to eat better. And so I, I still post pictures of my food. How cool is every that? Day. Sometimes I forget, but, um, but yeah, every day. That's amazing. It's, it's just something smo- so small that you can do that takes a little bit of time. And it's just something that you're doing every day and sharing it with yeah. The world is helping people. I know that Jillian, you're the only person that's going to see this, but I'm going to show you what my app, I, I take these on iPad. This is what, this is what my pictures look like. Oh my gosh. So colorful. So like just like page after plate page. Of food and such a food. colorful food on it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So fun. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for being a part of this podcast and sharing your wisdom and experience. I know it's helped many people who are listening. It has been so much fun. Thank you, Jillian, for asking. I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the past few months. Yes. All right. So if you're wanting to work with Sandra or just find her and see what she's up to, go to miracleinspirations.com. And um, she's also on Facebook, Sandra Lee. I'm sure she'd love to friend you. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, and I, I already am friends with lots of the, yeah. <laughs> so good. Thank you everybody. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye.